five. This, this is what you've been looking for. Octavia tried to tell us parable um, for today's pandemic and welcome everyone. We are so glad you're here. We're excited about how many people are interested in having this conversation. Absolutely. And I want to introduce to you Dr. Clayton Coleman, who is our public scholarship technology consultant, and he's going to do some moderating for us. Yes. Um, thank so you, I'm gonna, Hey, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to start by uh, sharing my screen, um, and that will include the presentation that we're going to, uh, slides for the presentation we're going to be having. Here we go. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here today on the weekend to talk about Octavia Butler's work and to have a conversation about today's pandemic. Um, our hosts today are glorious folks um, who are connected to Octavia Butler's work, um, Tanana Reeve Du and Dr. Monica A. Coleman. Um, so what I'm going to do first is give you all a plan for our time together. Um, and apologies again for the technological difficulties, but technology will do what it, what it will, and we will work around it. And that's what we're doing now. So we're going to start off with introductions. Um, we're going to then move to a conversation um, and then follow up or finish up with a question and answer from some of the questions that many of you um, submitted in the form when registering. Um, for those who would like to have discussions or conversations around um, what's happening in this room, please feel free to use the hashtag Octavia Try, and I put that down at the bottom for all of us here. Um, so what I want to do is start off by uh, introducing uh, our first panelist, Tanana Rivdu. Um, Tanana Rivdu is an award-winning author who teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. Uh, she's an executive producer on Shudder's groundbreaking documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror, uh, a leading voice in Black speculative fiction for more than 20 years, Do has won an American Book Award, an NAACP Award, Image Award, and a British Fantasy Award. Her writing has been included in Best of the Year anthologies. Her books include Ghost Summer Stories, My Soul to Keep, and The Good House. She and her late mother, civil rights activist Patricia Stevens Dew, co-authored Freedom in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. She's married to author Stephen Barnes, with whom she collaborates on screenplays. They live with their son, Jason, and two cats. Next, I want to introduce Dr. Monica E. Coleman. Dr. Coleman is a professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware. She's also an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. She works at the intersection of faith, culture, and social justice. She's the author of, or editor of six books and several articles and book chapters that focus on the role of faith in addressing critical, social, and philosophical issues. Her book, Making a Way Out of No Way, A Womanist Theology, is required reading at colleges and universities around the United States. Her memoir, Bipolar Faith, a, woman's, a Black Woman's Journey with Depression and Faith, received the Silver Illumination Award in 2017. Dr. Coleman speaks widely on religion and sexuality, religious pluralism, churches, and social media, mental health, and sexual and domestic violence. I want to thank both of our panelists for being here today. Um, and I want to transition into um, interview before we get the conversation started. Is that okay? Yeah, can I give a little bit of context? Oh, most certainly. Yes, please do. Right. So this is Tanana Reeve talking. Um, I, I knew Octavia Butler uh, briefly, uh, too briefly, frankly. I met her in 1997 at Clark Atlanta University, uh, which had a conference called the African American Fantastic Imagination. Uh, and I was just a new writer. My husband, Stephen Barnes, however, knew her for 20 years, was a very good friend. So... In 2000, a magazine called American Visions asked uh, me and Steve to go interview Octavia in her home. 
And this is a very, very brief excerpt from that conversation, uh, which has to do with what we called a bleakness of vision <laughs> in her, it, that was a thread in a lot of her work. One thing you'll notice as you listen to this is Octavia laughs. Uh, when, uh, I think being around Steve was always therapeutic for her. He brought out uh, laughter in her. But after we get through the laughing, she gets down to the nitty gritty, like what she really, really believed about us as humanity and why she has tried so hard to reach us and tell us <laughs> in her work. Thank you. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. Readers have uh, often commented what seems to be a, a bleakness of vision, an underlying threat of pessimism in much of your work. How would you address Blah. that? Blah. Blah. <laughs> oh, Sunshine. goodness. Well, hey, I mean, look at us. Look at us. Look what we keep doing. We keep marching to the brink and then drawing back. And the horrible thing is there are some things you can't draw back. I mean, even now, okay, um, the Russian ship goes up to the, the, the uh, Arctic and says, gee, there's, there's no ice here, you know, where we would expect to find ice. Mm -hmm. And I listened to several programs in which people said, well, maybe it's natural. Or, well, this, this happens occasionally, and um, nobody says global warming. Hmm. You know, except maybe the reporter who's asking questions. Is this global warming? Because that's the first thing I thought of. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I didn't think of global warming because there was a, a you know, a, a, with the North Pole, there was there was not that much ice. I thought of global warming because of the whole family of, of stuff that's been happening. Right. And it's not a matter of, oh, global warming will kill us, because it won't. Mm -hmm. But it'll kill a lot of people. Hmm. And it already is killing a lot of people in Africa. Hmm. But I mean, we've, we've got so many indicators and people find them inconvenient. So e they look at each one separately and say, well, you can't prove anything by this. And then, hmm. you know, we, we just don't seem to be, well, we're not, we're not really that long term. We're longer term than I guess any other animal species as far as thinking goes, but we're not long term enough for our technology. Hmm. It seems like what our technology is doing um, is, is, is helping us to um, do what every other species does, which is basically turning as much of the earth into ourselves as we can before we crash. Oof. Yeah. When she says, look at us, look mm -hmm. at us, uh, that fervor, you know, um, to help people see and understand is very much characteristic of Octavia's work, especially in Parable. Readers have. All right, so I want to turn this over, this conversation over to uh, Tanana Rivdu and Dr. Coleman. And we're still talking about par a Parable for today's pandemic. I hate to interrupt. Clayton, can you change uh, how you're sharing your screen so we see your slideshow? Oh, you're yeah, sure, a lot sure, of sure. questions in the Q&A. If they, if they can see that, it'll make the slides bigger. Sure, sure. Most certainly. Right. So that picture there, um, the top picture is from Howard University. Some of you may recognize Howard. Right to left, that's me. Um, the far right, the short one. Uh, next to the giant Octavia E. Butler in every way. Uh, and next to Octavia is Nalo Hopkinson, also um, a very well-respected writer. And at the far end is my uh, husband, Stephen Barnes, also a very uh, respected writer. And I met both Octavia and Stephen Barnes in the photo below which was at Clark Atlanta University at that groundbreaking conference. It was really the, maybe the first organized conference for black speculative writers. Uh, and I was very lucky that I had just published one book and had been uh, invited. But, but that's right to left, Stephen Barnes, Jewel Gomez. Some of you may know her work, uh, The Gilda Stories. Octavia is in the middle. Uh, there I am, uh, second from the, the, the left. And of course, the great Samuel R. Delaney is sitting next to Octavia who is a pioneering science fiction writer and was one of Octavia's teachers at the Clarion um, Writers Workshop. So that's who those photos are. 
So I guess, Monica, let's you and I um, have, a, have a chat now. If, if you could go out of uh, share screen, Clayton, um, so we can show our faces. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I guess I'll say how it began and then you can share Tanana Reed. So I sure. just texted Tanana Reed a little over a week ago and said, hey, wouldn't it be fun to do a webinar about Parable the Sower for these days? Um, and she said yes. And so we both love Parable. We love Octavia Butler. And it just seemed like a great time for us to talk about how she was is this is really a parable for where we are today um so i wanted you to begin to not even talk a bit about you know utopia and dystopia um and in some ways butler as a prophetess right um when you look at the date that this novel begins parable of the sower begins in the year 2024 and here we are knocking on the door of that you know, we, and, and even from the first time I read it, it felt like a world that was close enough to touch and it has felt closer and closer upon subsequent readings, but perhaps never has it felt closer than it does right now. You know, not necessarily exactly how, how she wrote it. There's no drug that makes people set fires, not literally, although, <laughs> although figuratively, yes, we definitely do have something in the air that is causing people to set fires and, and do things that are, are medically and scientifically unsound and against their own personal interests in the, in the name of some sort of a, uh, a political stance. So we can see a uh, parable unfolding as this dystopia, which has within it nestled a utopia. Um, and I will reference an essay by a scholar named Ellen Peel, who wrote an essay called God is Change, Persuasion and Pragmatic Utopianism in Octavia E. Butler's Earthseed novels. And she definitely makes that point that it is a utopia within a dystopia, which is why I think the, the novel and really both of them resonate with us so much. Uh, just a quick personal story. When, when, I, when Parable first came out, of course, I devoured it. I couldn't wait. But it was such a difficult story. It's like, oh my goodness. Once I had a full picture of the world of this teenager, Lauren Olamina, who was living in a community that was beyond the gated communities we have. It's literally uh, a guarded community, which is a difference uh, between a gated community and a guarded community. Um, that was just barely hanging on while society has fallen apart around it. Rampant, rampant um, houselessness, as we would say now, uh, violence outside of the wall, uh, drug, drug addicts who take pleasure in setting fires, so highly destructive. It's just a really, as you know, if you read this novel, it is a very, very difficult world. And I had a hard time as a reader relaxing into that world. I, I, I loved it and I, I wanted to read it, but I could only read four or five pages at a time and I had to walk away. And, and an incredible thing happened. As the novel went on, I got stronger as a reader, just as Lauren Olamina, this teenager, as she's only 15 when the story begins, um, also got stronger as she faced her challenges. So by the end, I was reading like huge, huge, you know, 20, 30 pages at a time. And when I got to the, the parable of the sower, uh, the scripture at the end of the book, I just, I just sobbed. And part of my sobbing was because of the horror of the world that she had created. And part of my sobbing was because of the hope for the world that she had created, both of those things. So there's the, the horror and there's the hope side by side within this novel. And one of the things that Octavia also mentioned in that interview is that she's looking for solutions to try to sort of sway us from the path that she saw. You know, I tell my students that being a radical is just someone who pays attention. And Octavia was very much a person who paid attention. She listened to the news. She, she couldn't look away. While a lot of us sort of read it and it's in one, you know, ear and out the other, she could not look away from that, that flame and that fear. So she mentioned that her novel Dawn, for example, created extraterrestrials she thought might be able to help us survive. 
And in Parable of the Sower, instead, what she now has created is a religion she's hoping will help us survive. And, and that's going to be a lot of the crux of our conversation, because I have a, a fantastic theologian with me. But it's so interesting to me that Octavia in life had fallen away from traditional religion, much like her character Lauren Olamina had fallen away from traditional religion. And yet, when she was looking for that thing that could help create hope and help save humanity, she literally created a religion <laughs> in Earth Seed. So I find that that very interesting. And and I don't want to go on and on too much, but I will just tell one last anecdote. Uh, I, I'm not a practitioner so much, or I have not considered myself a practitioner of Earthseed, but I did have a very vivid experience with the power of Earthseed on Election Day in 2016, when uh, he who shall not be named was a elected president of the United States, and I could not understand. Like I was refreshing my computer screen and I couldn't make his face go away. I literally could not understand what had happened. And this earth seed parable, the only lasting truth is change, landed in my head. And I thought, oh, this is a pendulum swing from one, from one reality to another reality. And while I never would have imagined it, it within that parable the only lasting truth that's changed it makes perfect sense and that was the only way i could go to bed that night and make sense of it and some of you may have similar stories i've, I've come back to that phrase during this pandemic as well uh as a hypochondriac i struggle with worry that i've contracted COVID 19 you know uh in the beginning it was almost nightly so i you know i'll deal whatever whatever happens i i will rise to that occasion i find those earth seed parables very helpful in in my life you know um, clearly this is what really attracted me <laughs> into parable of the sower i began reading octavia butler through the pattern master series <laughs> then through xenogenesis so i was ready when parable came and it's so different, right? It's kind of like Kindred. It's not like the, par like the Pattern Masters in a Genesis series. Um, and I loved it. <laughs> and as many of you know, I'm a theologian, so I traffic in belief <laughs> and the ways that we think about God. And if you're a stu former student of mine, you know, I probably have taught this book to you because it is such um, a haunting, be hauntingly beautiful book, really, um, particularly when it comes to theology. And I love it because she's a girl, like she's not, right? <laughs> you know, she's, she's 15, she's a teenager, Lauren, our main character. And she looks around and she's like, what I've been given is not working for me. What I've been taught doesn't make any sense for my context. And I just started writing down things I've noticed and <laughs> making preparations <laughs> and trying to think of another way and what am, what am I seeing and what makes sense to me? And she comes up with Earthseed. And I love that because this is how we do theology at its best. Right? We look around and say, what's not working? What do I notice? What would make sense? How can I get myself free, me and my people? Right? How, can I, how can we be free? And what do we need to understand and believe about ourselves and about God and about community to get there? Um, I pulled a couple line, a couple p verses of Earthseed, if you will, which is her theology. Um, it's her scripture, really. And um, the one that you just mentioned to Nana Reeve, all you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. No. Um, I'll read another one. Why is the universe to shape God? Why is God to shape the universe? And this is a very non-Western way of thinking about God. <laughs> it's, um, we think about God shaping us, but to think of us shaping God is not as classical, at least particularly in, in Western and Christian tr traditions. Um, and yet it's, it gives us, it reminds us of the agency we have, that God is affected by us just as we are affected by God. And that's really what drew me to process theology, because it's a theology of change. And it very much affirms the symbiotic relationship between God and people. 
Uh, I wanted to talk for a minute and I shared this with Tanana Reed, even when I first met her, you may remember this, and I think it was 2009 we met. Um, it was an old picture of that, but we won't, put, we won't share that screen. <laughs> and at least from 20, 2009, 2010. Um, so in that, um, I, you know, what really, what really grabbed my attention when I was reading Parable was the theology and then her name, Lauren Oya Olamina. I mean, if we could have been in mm. Butler's head, I mean, we have her papers, so we get a lot of it. <laughs> um, but I love the naming of Oya because she's calling on, you know, an Orisha from the traditional Yoruba religion and um, Yoruba-based religions. Because you see Oya in Ifa, you see Oya in Lukumi and in Candomblé and many other traditions. And she is this fierce Orisha of change, right? She is the whirlwind. And you write about Oya in, I think, in Living Blood. <laughs> um, mm. And she comes in and she's, she's like, right? She's a hurricane, she's a tornado. Um, she brings change. And there will be transformation, but it's up to us if it's creative or destructive transformation. You know, and I think we get to see both of those in parable. We see what a destructive transformation looks like. We see with the government and the um, fear and communities are doing with their ability to affect others. Um, and it, that's the dystopia, right? But then she gives us this utopia in the middle of it, right? right? She, she gives us, this is what creative transformation could look like in the middle of, you know, what are really perilous times. And yeah, if I could just, you've inspired so many thoughts for me <laughs> here, but when we were talking about um, earthseed passages that are powerful mm -hmm. and, and what, and part of what is powerful about earthseed is Octavia created it is on the one hand, we're sort of trading away our traditional um, Judeo-Christian version of what God is supposed to be sort of his eyes on the sparrow mm -hmm. kind of idea. But at the same time, embracing, as you say, more of our power and our agency in shaping God. And one of those passages is belief initiates and guides action or it does nothing. And this is something that a lot of us need to embrace and live by because we are having very strong beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but those beliefs in a vacuum uh, are robbed of their power. It's, it's action that has lasting power. And, and I, I love that she included that. Oh, can I read another Earthseed verse? Oh, please. <laughs> and we're just going to geek out here for a second. Um, she says, respect God, pray working, pray learning, planning, doing, pray creating, teaching, reaching, pray working, pray to focus your thoughts, still your fears, strengthen your purpose, respect God, shape God, pray working. Mm. I know. <laughs> right, working. <Yes. laughs> right, you know, but there's that activity for her. There's that action. Um, you know, she was doing this and she was planning. And once she gets on the road, and you know, if you're not from California, you know, when you're, if you, when I'm not from California, right? Neither you're not from California. But once you get there, you're like, oh, I can really see this. <laughs> you know, yes. you can, you can imagine her walking, you know, you get a sense of the geography that's really unique in many ways, right? Of microclimates in Southern California to Northern California, you're still in the same state, but you're in these very different climates, different yes. communities. Um, and getting a sense of what, what she's undertaking, right? And I have to say, this is, I'm sure there's some literary people on here. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a slave narrative, right? I mean, it's a narrative to freedom. It's mm -hmm. going north to get free and to build and create something and taking you know, a band with you. I mean, it's very Harriet Tubman. -esque. Very Harriet Tubman. <laughs> now that you mention it, absolutely. Very Harriet Tubman. Um, so, you know, those are the things that have really excited me about it and that seem relevant. I mean, it's, you know, in, in religious scholarship, prophecy isn't about telling the future. Um, it's also about looking around and making a social justice critique, right? And saying, this is what will happen if you don't get your stuff together. <laughs> and this is what can happen if you do get it together, right? And it's, it's kind of calling those things out. And I think we see so much of that um, with Parable the Sower, even from the way she describes politics and the slogan, Make America Great Again. I mean, who would have known? <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and to say that, wow, especially with what we're seeing now with the economy, with, um, I'll just say the abuse of power at high levels, we can, it's not so hard to imagine how you end up in the kind of society she's describing, where people are really ruled by fear, right? And those who have the money create communities that block them off from others. And those who have nothing else are desperate yes. um, and have very desperate ways of trying to stay alive. And we're seeing that play out now, this um, amazing, uh, not in the good way, uh, contrast between sort of the celebrities on quarantine where any given day you can tune into an Instagram live and see a celebrity doing something random uh, in their homes, you know, in a sort of this cheerful way of getting through this time. And then you contrast that with the huge food lines uh, that have cropped up in, in major cities and these highly militaristic protests like we just saw in Michigan with armed people storming you know uh, it's almost as if and this has always been true but it's so sharp now this is what I tell my students I teach at UCLA that it's really been sharpened into relief um, how inequity works uh, overall but certainly in a time of crisis like you said those who can and I'm blessed to be one of those people with a full pantry and I'm still right now getting a paycheck and all that good stuff uh, whereas other people daily are losing their jobs, uh, are having housing insecurity, who are stuck in isolation with abusive partners. Children, uh, very early on, became like the highest segment of callers to a sexual abuse line, which is just so horrific to think about. Now these children are trapped with their abusers all the time. So as a nation, yeah, we're going through a hard time, but a hard time means different things <laughs> according to where you are on this social and economic scale. Right. And I mean, I think there's, I mean, just like, you know, Butler was able to show us some beauty in it, some creativity in it. You know, I think we have the chance to create beauty here, right? We have the chance to, I mean, for so many people, it's like you're getting to really appreciate um, certain kinds of workers, right? We appreciate, anyone with school-aged children really appreciates their teachers right now because Ooh, they're all no, home, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, and maybe we did before, but as a society, we get to see just the important role that teachers have play, are playing, not just to, give, to go to your last comment in teaching kids, but they're the people who report abuse, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're the, kind of, in many ways, that first line. We're appreciating our health professionals. We're appreciating grocery, know, store, grocery workers. store workers, right? Delivery, factory workers. Delivery people. And it's an opportunity to, to treat people better, right? To get right. fair wages um, or, you know, that kind of thing. And it's an opportunity with what we see in Lauren to craft our way forward, right? Yes. To craft our way forward with a belief that makes sense for what we see. Maybe your faith isn't serving you. <laughs> Maybe what you've been given isn't serving you, your philosophy, your theology. And it's a way, that, you know, the community you're in, you need a new community. I mean, she, she makes a new world. She makes mm. a new community. Um, she really does say this, and she's 15, and I'm like, okay, yes. so if she can do it, <laughs> you know, if, I mean, she's a fictional character, but it's not so far off, right? Um, if she can think about, hey, I've got to adapt to this, then we can mm. adapt, and we can say, how can we continue to create community? And we see that too, right? We see people coming together, making sure everyone has what they need in terms of food and donations. I mean, so we are seeing these glimpses, right, of what we could be and who we should be in the midst of this too. Right, and I think a uh, parable is especially helpful for people who are fighting despair. And I know a lot of people are, obviously, suicide hotlines are also lighting up as people's uh, personal feelings of despair mm -hmm. feel like they're being uh, mirrored <laughs> with mm -hmm. the external world as, it feels like humanity is, can feel like humanity is dying off. I mean, quite literally, it's not true that all of humanity mm -hmm. is dying off, but in a pandemic mm -hmm. that has so much of a random factor to it, like mm -hmm. some people are asymptomatic, some people are in ICU, um, grieving alone, suffering alone, dying alone. You know, these are all really, really scary ideas. These are the things that I struggle with in terms of my own anxieties, having to meditate and having to center myself much more so than usual. But looking at a world like Parable, which 
is still worse than ours, thank goodness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> By this much, you know, it's we still- have four years to get there. <laughs> I mean, we've got four more years before we get to this. So while we're in this space, um, that utopian factor is for us, daily gratitude, okay? Mm -hmm. Gratitude for my life, gratitude for my health. If, if we're ill, gratitude that I, I could be more ill than I am. Or mm -hmm. if someone has passed away, gratitude that their suffering has ended or whatever it is, finding ways to live in gratitude is tremendously helpful uh, because of the contrast mm -hmm. the parable of the sower gives us. But then there's also that step ladder that the earth seed uh, verses represent and how to pull ourselves beyond just gratitude and oh, well, things could be worse, but, but a feeling that inspires something more proactive, which is what you were speaking to, Monica. Mm -hmm. And there's really no better way to feel better about our own circumstances than in service to other people. You know, mm -hmm. um, giving a little bit of money here, there's a rent fund that when I can, I give money to on Twitter and individuals, you know, I, I've, I've given, when I can, you know, it's not much, but, but people often don't need much. They need grocery money. You know, mm -hmm. um, this is, this is what we're living in. So I see uh, a roadmap and parable that helps me focus on belief initiates and guides action or does nothing. Uh, accepting every new headline that is just horrifying as, okay, the only lesson truth is change, <laughs> right. you know, and finding that path forward without having despair. Uh, despair is so difficult uh, to, to, as you know, and, and maybe you, I don't know if you want to speak to that for how people who have struggled with depression. Um, and then we're living in times where even people who don't suffer from depression are, are <laughs> starting to get a taste of what that feels like. Well, I mean, yeah, isolation is the enemy, <laughs> so to yeah. say, of of so much mental health. And so, um, I mean, we're all regressing a bit, even in our, at our, on our best days, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're going, right. we're regressing. If you have kids, they're regressing. We're all regressing um, to usually not our best selves uh, because there's so much grief and there's so much uncertainty. Um, and, you know, we're isolated, even if you're isolated with other people. That's not the kind, we're not, we are human beings. We are made for community right? We're made to be with people. And these conditions, um, mental health challenges, make you feel like you're the only person who knows despair and that you're alone and no one sees you and you're right. invisible. Um, and so isolation is the last thing <laughs> that you need usually. Um, mm -hmm. Even if you're introverted, you still need to know there are other people you can get to. Um, and we can't, you know, many times we can't get to our closest loved ones um, safely. And so, it's it's a challenge, right? And I mean, there there's some great things where do, people are doing online around mental health um, that you can find. Um, but you know, it's <laughs> public health, mental health, right? It's mm. it's this hard hard thing. And so um, I know you've got some ideas about it and about ways that we can you know maintain our I mean balance is such a fallacy right <laughs> but we right. can we can maintain ourselves <laughs> you know that we can we can survive right well you know art has been tremendously helpful so we can look at art on the level of how Octavia's art has been mm -hmm. such a gift to all of us uh, as a, again mm -hmm. this sort of uh, through the funhouse mirror mm -hmm. of what our society feels like even right. if it's not literally what our society is with the stepladder to help us climb out you know beautiful mm -hmm but also for those of us who are artists or who've even thought about being artists, because you know, the joke is everyone has a quarantine hobby, but it's not really just a joke. My, my husband has taken up piano. He found a course by Quincy Jones on the internet and he is really <laughs> learning how to play <laughs> piano. Um, I literally last night typed at the end on a novel I've been working on for seven years called The Reformatory. And in a lot of ways, I know artists are struggling with, with creation during these times and and if, if you can't create then that's fine don't beat yourself up because you can't mm -hmm. but if you find yourself with that time and with just sort of that feeling that you need to create mm -hmm. I, I i have that i mean mine was partially fueled by literally being afraid that i would die before i finished 
<laughs> my book, you know, telling my husband, okay, you can work on it. And here's this other writer, maybe, you know, I, I only have about 15 pages left, but I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's that artist's fear, right? Like, I can't right. die before it's but, done. And it's not, you know, that's not something I walked around with because I've been working on this for seven years. But the, the pandemic, of course, has made that sharper too. So I don't know that that's a healthy place to create from. But it worked for me is all I'm saying. And, and for me, it was literally uh, sometimes just a sentence a day, which is something that my husband and I teach in our program called Life Writing, which is about the holistic life of the writer as well as the work of the writer, which, you know, you don't always have a two hour block to work on your art. So if you write a sentence a day or even a paint stroke a day or a photograph a day or whatever yeah. the, the equivalent is for your kind of art, Mm -hmm. Octavia is teaching us through her art yeah. that we, because trust me, uh, you heard that clip of Octavia from the beginning mm -hmm. and I never discussed mental health with her, but I know that she did struggle with feeling that, that emotional balance. How can you not when you are of the kind of personality and mindset where you're staring head on into the abyss? She's just right. like looking into the abyss and the rest of us are just doop de doop de doop. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Well, and that doop de doop de doop is our marriages and our kids and our families and our jobs. Octavia was a writer, writer. That was right. what she did. That was all she did. She lived by herself um, for much of her life. And she listened to a lot of news, going back to that idea that radicals are people who are paying attention. And if you believe that knowing something is sort of uh, a mandate to act upon it, then that was how she chose to act was through her art. And thank goodness she did. And we, and that's a model for all of us mm -hmm. that we can look at the hardest challenges we're facing, the toughest things, the, the toughest questions and interrogate those through art. Well, I'm looking at our time and now might be a great moment for, um, Dr. Coleman, the other Dr. Coleman Clay <laughs> to uh, mm -hmm. give us some questions. We, received what about 200 questions ahead of time yes and we're going to answer every one of them <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna yeah we're gonna get to some of these we tried to condense them can so can you tell us what you've got yeah sure 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 um i'll start with a question that connects in some ways about noticing that you both were talking about earlier mm -hmm. um and it it's specifically about hyper empathy um so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about hyper empathy and the connection to today's political and social climate that's a great question. Did you, did you want me to jump in first, Monica? Yes. I know what you have to say about it. I love well, it. Well, <laughs> I, you know, um, hyper empathy for people who haven't read uh, Parable or haven't finished it. Lauren Olamina has what was considered a, a birth defect, a condition called hyper empathy, which is that she perceives that she, and bleeds even uh, if she is exposed to the pain of others. So if she sees someone who's hurt, she will feel that pain. Even if she's fighting someone, if she punches them in the nose, she will feel her own punch in the nose. Mm -hmm. So of course, it is a very difficult decision for her to use violence against anyone. Um, and there are a lot of other things. I mean, obviously it's portrayed as a disability. It's something she hid from others. It's something her family wanted to keep a secret. It's something she goes to great lengths to hide from either other people that have followed her, you know, on, on this road of, of trials and parable of the sower, but it actually emerges as what I would call a superpower. And I really feel that when Octavia wrote about hyper empathy, she was in many ways writing about herself mm -hmm. as the artist, that she herself, while it wasn't a literal, like, I'm going to bleed if I see you bleed, in some ways she was bleeding. She was bleeding. She was watching us as she said in that that video of uh, that audio clip marching to the brink and then pulling back and sometimes you can't pull back um, and I think even Octavia herself would have been shocked at, at how denial has played a factor in human, human survivability that we but anyway let me not digress so the hyper empathy as portrayed by Octavia in Parable of the Sower in the end is not a disability but a superpower it is because of that empathy that she is keeping her her eye on the ball you know she's just so aware of of her community of she's so aware of the people around her of their circumstances it forces her to be a planner it forces her to embrace nonviolence whenever possible to be have, very thoughtful about violence because yeah. it will literally hurt her <laughs> and and also to care enough 
that she would come up with the earth seed religion, you know, as, as her own personal map through uh, these times and the life she was living in. So without hyper empathy, maybe there wouldn't have been no Lauren Olamina. Right. I mean, and she also gets to feel pleasure, right? I mean, <laughs> true. let's not forget the pleasure part. Yeah. There's pleasure, so to say, but there was so much pain in the world. You know, Butler says that that was her primary feeling. Um, and I mean, and it's something that it becomes her superpower, but it's something that, you know, we're all, hopefully many of us have the choice to become more empathetic than we've been, right? To see ourselves in the shoes of other people and to, to, to walk with, even in our own grief, the, the, the massive grief, right, that is happening right now. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's a, it, and it gives the chance to show us you know, what saviors are made of, <laughs> like right. what, what leaders are made of. You have to care. You have to imagine. And if it hurts you to hurt others, you're, you know, you have a different relationship to your right. life. If you feel everything you do to other people, right, which is how we should be um, in many ways. Right. And, and, and for whatever um, problems and critiques there may have been for President Obama, he was an empathetic leader uh, in the sense that he would cry publicly uh, after the, the massacre in Charleston. He sang Amazing Grace, which, which I think was, I mean, I don't know for certain, but it felt like it was a spontaneous act to address the grief of the moment, you know? And there are those who could argue that his empathy could have extended um, further, of course. But let's just contrast that to our current leadership, which is so rudderless, in part because of the lack of expressed empathy. Um, there are things that a president is responsible for that are actually um, action points, like you, you allocate funds, you open this inquiry, you make an executive order, but there's the part of being president that is just sort of to be the spiritual leader for the country. And sometimes the spiritual leader just has to say, I feel your pain. And we don't feel that. <laughs> we don't feel that our leader is feeling our pain or on one level that our leader even cares about our pain because he only seems to express his own pain. And, and that is, you know, it's so dispiriting, you know, not to, not to even have that um, as, as, as limited a role as the presidency might've been, it feels even in more, limited and irrelevant than ever. And Monica, you may have frozen again, but I think we will still be able to hear you. Are you still there? Whoops. Her screen might have frozen. Let me uh, ask her if her, her screen is frozen. Ah, no. Oh, there she is. <laughs> hey. I sent you a little text. I was like, run to get my computer cord. Okay. Oh, that was what it was. Okay. Sometimes it's the last thing you said, because I had to run upstairs. Oh, I was talking about the lack of empathy in our current administration and how dispiriting it is. Oh, I know. Yeah. But it's a great contrast. <laughs> well, it, again, it's that way of destructive. Around. It's that way of destructive transformation, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. And, 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 and speaking to what you said, for people, you know, who might not have given much thought to, to how the role of the president can be helpful in life, <laughs> now we're like, aha, yeah, I need that. I need that part where the president expresses empathy, where the president seems to feel our pain, will, will uh, even just to mention that this horrible mm -hmm. thing has happened, which often he will yeah. not, like a horrible thing, not a word, not a word from the White House. Yeah. And it reminds us, and I know we'll get to talk about this more later, that we need other models of leadership, right? Like, yes. <laughs> there's a person with the political power, but that may not be our leader, right? <laughs> that our yeah, leaders exactly. may Exactly. Who is come. the leader? What is leadership? <laughs> right. DJ D. Nice became a leader on Instagram. <laughs> oh, I know, right? <laughs> with his turntable. That's a kind of leadership. Right. You know? So we are seeing emergent leadership, which is, which is fascinating to watch. And, and those are the things that we want to cling to uh, in the future when hopefully we can go out and be around people, mm -hmm. but re-examining our assumptions about who the leaders are and what role yeah. leaders play. And how so much of leadership emerges from people just sharing, right? Sharing their gifts, sharing their talents yes. um, freely with whoever can get to them, right? Absolutely. Was there another question? Clayton? Sure. Um, I know we 
that more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is getting to the comments that you both made about creativity and imagination. Um, quite a few people asked about the role that imagination plays in shaping change, um, particularly in this bleak present and uncertain future. So I wonder if you could talk a bit more about um, imagination, particularly critical imagination. You want to start that one, Monica? No, really. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think I'll, I'll say two things um, which are connected, you know, in process thought, which is what I focus on, you know, creativity is its own thing, right? <laughs> like everything is creative. Everything is creativity. Um, and I, you know, without getting deeply into it, imagination is what gives us the ability to envision something new, right? Um, Otherwise, we have no novelty. We, we only have what we've had before. But when you can imagine something new or something different for yourself, for others, for your community, um, that's what leads us forward creatively, right? It's the ability to imagine another world. I mean, and that's, I mean, you said so much about Butler and imagining new worlds. <laughs> um, True. But being able to, you know, daydream, <laughs> you know, in some ways and say, what if? Right? I mean, that's science fiction, right? That's Afrofuturism. It's the what if. Absolutely. What if. And, and one thing I, I tell my students, if they're listening, they'll, they'll recognize this from UCLA, is that there are two types of world building by my way of thinking that goes into a science fiction novel like Parable of the Sower. The, the traditional kind of world building in fiction means the trappings of that world. What year is it? What are the new technologies of that time? What are the social habits and, and, and structures of that time? And that is world building but also a novel like Octavia's inspires us to try to do real life world building. And that is where the imagination goes out of the realm of fiction and becomes these kinds of questions about how do we take this picture we have in our, our minds of what we want society to look like and, ab and actually enact those changes that will lead us toward that. And that is imagination. Uh, my, late mother, Patricia Stevens do, my father who's still living, um, a civil rights lawyer, he calls himself a freedom lawyer, um, had imagination in the 1960s. They didn't know that there were black women working at NASA. Nobody knew about the hidden figures, uh, but they had the imagination to understand that if we were just given opportunities, who knows what black people and marginalized groups could create. So you put your life on the line. Literally, my mother would lie down in front of sanitation trucks. Every time you went on a march, you were putting your life on the line in a white supremacist society that does not value black bodies. Look at how we're not valued today and extrapolate that back to the 1960s, right? So it's an act of imagination to hold up a sign and demand a better world when there is no evidence that that world is going to open up to you to have that kind of tenacity and vision. So that's the social imagination. And what really pains me about the anti-science administration we have now is that previous administrations would bring in science fiction writers, not just scientists, but fiction writers to serve on committees to help try to mold uh, a path forward with science and technology. Because even at the highest levels they understood that what scientists know about the world is not sufficient to the task. The artists also have to sit at the table, right? So imagination is this, this powerful, powerful vehicle. And, and one last thing I wanna say is a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to hear um, Angela Davis speak and, and Afrofuturism had come up tangentially and she was sort of addressing this idea of how she keeps her, her optimism, you know? Because if you've ever met Angela Davis, the, the activist, she is just this gentle, light-filled person. <laughs> when you think of her as just sort of fiery, you know, and, and but she's she's a light-filled person. She's she's not beaten down. I mean, think of all the setbacks she has seen over her life. She has not been beaten down. And the question was, how do you hold on to that light? And and her answer has really stuck with me. You know, she said when, and I, it's not a direct quote, but I'll paraphrase her, that when you are trying to build a better future, no matter how you're trying to do it, whether it's as an artist or as a judge or as a scientist, you have to believe in that future. You may not live to see it. It may happen a hundred years from now, but it's the belief in that future. In other words, it's that imagination that keeps you going as an activist. 
And I think where people fall into pessimism, and, and I think, you know, my parents' generation suffered from some pessimism. I, I would have thought they would have been a lot happier when we had a reunion, you know, 40 years after the movement, because, you know, there were so many uh, surface kinds of strides, right? But they kept their eyes on what they saw rolling back. They, they, they were always convinced that their gains from the 60s could be very easily turned back. And it's only now that I have a greater understanding for why that generation was starting to feel that pessimism. And that is why it is cyclical. That is the young people who look at the world as it is, are not comparing it to what it was, saying, oh, it's so much better now. It's like, no, this is my future, my world. It's not what I want it to look like. And they take that baton and they move forward with their optimism and their imagination. Do you have another question? These are such beautiful answers, thank you. Um, so another question talks about, and, and both of you mentioned this too, um, the idea of earth seed being an actual philosophy that you can mobilize, um, something that you can use today for um, collective liberation. So I wondered if you, could, you both could talk a bit about that. You don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> <laughs> like earth seed for everyone. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it as a belief system, as a theology alone, I mean, I think it's the one we should go with, <laughs> you know, I mean, I think, and it's because she looks around, right, and sees and, and change, right, and then she keeps adapting and giving lyrical form as, which, I mean, that's the art, right, in Lauren, even, <laughs> um, she doesn't write a treatise, she writes scripture, she writes poetry um, to what she sees and says, how do, you know, how, this is going to shape us. This is going to determine how we believe. Um, she kicked to the curb beliefs that weren't working for her, right? Ones that were narrow, ones that were exclusivist, ones that had hierarchical leadership. I mean, she attaches them to her father, but they could be from anywhere, right? Um, and this is what she embraces, and she teaches it to others and says, I hope you get down with it too, right? I hope that you can see value in this like I do. I hope this makes sense to you. I hope this works for you. This is where it's come from. And so, I mean, even to think of this as a way we orient ourselves in the world around change, around action, around creativity, right? Around, around a symbiotic relationship with God um, as compared to an I obey you <laughs> relationship with God, right? Um, or I trust you to protect me if I do something that is counter science right right, right. <laughs> like it doesn't make you choose between god and science right? right um and it's not a god that's going to protect you a god that betrays you right it's a god that you're in relationship with right um and that 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 you know and cares about the world it's not you know like god is active for for lauren and her crew but everybody <laughs> right mm. and so um, and those, and she, so she's like, there's some hard truths here too that we want, that we have to look at and work with. Um, and so for me, this is the way we should be living, right? This is the way we should be looking at the world with the ways we, we can be thinking about our faith um, within existing faith traditions or even outside of them, right? It's a philosophy as well um, as a theology. So I'm like, yes, yes, let's, let's go to it. And it does, it will change the way we boost ourselves up, right? The way we maintain our own practices, but it also will change the way we interact in community, right? It changes the way we do leadership. It changes the way we, we, we work with people <laughs> and teach with people um, and the way, and it changes where we look for salvation, right? That we're, we see it amongst ourselves. We see it in the communities that we're building and the things that we're creatively transforming. It's, and in the mirror, you know, right. the power of the individual to enact change. Sorry to jump in there. No, just, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I just got excited. And some of you may be familiar, uh, but if not, I, I have to suggest a book called Emergent Strategy, mm -hmm. Shaping Change, Changing Worlds by Adrienne Marie Brown, mm -hmm. Emergent Strategy, which is really all about this question of inspired by Octavia, of how we can shift leadership models away from sort of the top down model that has prevailed for so long. And re-examine really what our idea of what leadership is in a changing world and we're working on bringing her for a future webinar this is going to be a series it's a series 
it's a series of webinars. You all will not believe the light up we have coming up, but uh, we're working on booking a date with, with Adrian so she can discuss emergent strategy herself. But she is all about that. She travels around the country and helps organizations adopt um, methods that have been inspired by Earthseed to, to, it, to actually enact them in the world and create real community. What else do we have, Clay Coleman? Definitely. Um, so I want to I want to send a shout out to both of you. Both of you um, are connecting very organically with conversations that are happening on Twitter, which is wonderful. <laughs> I, I can't um, help retweeting constantly, even when I'm in a <laughs> webinar. <laughs> I, I'm not that good. <laughs> but I'll, I'll I'll hit you later. I hit you when it's over. I'll retweet then. Um, so one of the uh, questions, and we, and we talked a little bit about this, and this, a couple of people on Twitter asked this, about um, what would be in your runny sack, um, this idea of uh, survival, and what you would have to, what you want to put in there when you're making one for the future. Oof. He gave us time to think about this. Too, and we, I know, we still don't I, have anything. I squandered mine. <laughs> well, you know, real talk, uh, when this pandemic first well, really, when the pandemic first, not even so much started to emerge in the US, but when I started to notice the disconnect between the messaging from the White House and what I was reading from elsewhere in the world, and there was this unpredictability factor, the toilet papers disappearing, and, and I, you know, I didn't know where this was going or where it was headed, so made sure we had full tanks of gas in the cars so, to flee, literally. And I think a lot of people since 2016 have kind of felt that low key sense that you might need to jump in your car and run, whether it's a wildfire or a hurricane. A lot of the federal structures that we relied upon in the past are not in place. <laughs> so <laughs> this idea that if something goes down, we are on our own, you know, and, and I don't have to tell you all. I know a lot of you probably feel the same way. Some of you already have uh, go bags in your cars or under your beds, but it would be water, lots and lots of water. You can go without food a lot longer than you can go without water. Um, a simple, repetitive kind of food. I wrote a short story called Herd Immunity, which was actually a plague story where she was carrying around primate feed that she had found at a vet's office because my husband, who's always experimenting with the simplest way to get nourishment without having to fix a meal, actually bought some of these balls of primate feed, which had all of the nutrients that a human would need, but they tasted terrible. <laughs> But that, like some kind of a simple food source, that's just the survival level. level. And I hate to say it, a weapon. Um, I'm not a violent person, but it can be a violent world. And I would definitely have a weapon of some kind in my car, not necessarily a gun, but a weapon of some kind in my car for protection. And just sort of on the, the soul level, uh, the Bible my mother gave me when I was young, uh, a copy of Freedom in the Family, the book that I co-authored with my late mother, and wow, I don't even know what else. I mean, I'm looking at my bookshelf. You can't take them. Maybe my Kindle with all my books on it. How about that? <laughs> In a way to power it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, what's in our go bag? You know, we're all going to have go bags since this is over runny sacks. Um, you know, I'd have paper and pen. I have these, I like a certain kind of blue pen. It just oh my God, happy. I can't forget, believe I forgot to say that. <laughs> what a writer am I? <laughs> I grab Parable the Sower. Um, I grab photo albums. Like, I just love photo albums. Like, I just grab a couple um, from my family, you know, that I have all over the house. Um, you know, water. Uh, you know, those power packs, you know, where you can recharge everything. Um, I wish we had a solar one. Um, you know, I was several... Oh, God, over a year ago, I was going to a rural part of Africa and thought I might not be able to find vegan food and <laughs> um, got these kind of campfire vegan foods where, you know, you add hot water and you get mac and cheese. Um, and it's not what you'd make at home, but I grab, I have, still have a box of those. <laughs> so I would, that, that, would be in the, that would be in the go bag and a little thermos that you can put them in. Um, but, you know, I guess in terms of the things that we literally can't live with. Um, but I think it's also the things that I you psychically can't live without, right? Um, so I would grab, you know, the spiritual tools of my trade, <laughs> so to say. 
um, that would be really important for me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a key, a leke's, probably a Bible, mm -hmm. my grandmother's Bible, because that's the one that's got all the things in it, you know, all your family history in it, um, the funeral programs, right? <laughs> Um, so I think that's, I think, you know, that, that memory making, that history part is important to me. Um, mm -hmm. Gosh, I wish I could say, I mean, I guess maybe because we're talking about parables, so I'd grab it, but I would have grabbed it anyway, right? right. <laughs> like, like I, I just love it. It pains me. I think I have like five copies in my office and I can't get to my office. But luckily I had just typed up favorite phrases all over the years <laughs> and put them in Good. files. So I'm like, I can always get to Earthseed. Oh yeah, my Absolutely. backup files and my laptop. <laughs> Literally and figuratively. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I guess we should grab some clothes, right? <laughs> oh, right, clothes. Uh, yeah, changes of underwear. That's what I always <laughs> think about. I mean, not to just take it to that real level, but when I watch like shows, post-apocalyptic shows like The Walking Dead or even mm -hmm. War, all I can think about is, oh my gosh, the shower, the clothing, the underwear. <laughs> Your grandmother's saying you never get in a car. Twenty pack, a twenty pack of underwear. <laughs> <laughs> right, Those couple of cotton, you know, t-shirts made of that soft kind of cotton. Yeah, that feels good when you have it on. Right. I mean, we're joking, but that is the sad thing that we are we are living in times. And in California, there's always the fear of earthquakes. And and right. I think part of our our fascination with zombie culture and zombie films and speaking as a horror lover myself who loves zombie movies is this notion that it is going to happen not zombies mm -hmm. but there might be people banging on your door breaking your windows you might have to flee you might have to protect yourself and I think that that sense has just been growing since 2016 for me personally and it's very very sharp now in 2020 um, hopefully it won't continue to feel sharper and sharper as the years yeah. go on but having lived through this pandemic, I think we all just sort of need to be mindful and a little wary of this idea of going back to normal and, and whatever that even means, because we, we can't go back to normal. Um, what's happening with COVID-19 in our prison system, and one of the people I know who got infection has a husband who works in a federal prison as a therapist. So he contracted it at work brought it home to his wife, his teenage daughter, and it has been a real lesson on how little care there is, not just for people who are in prison, but people who work with people in prison. Let us never forget that, how we yeah. have dehumanized so many workers. We have dehumanized everyone in prison, workers and inmates alike. We've dehumanized even doctors and medical workers. So that, that normal, <laughs> is sort of a false goal. What we, what we want to not return to, but move toward is a, a new normal that is more humanizing, right. that is more empathetic. And really, we, none of us should walk away forgetting how fragile so many of these systems we have taken for granted really are when a crisis emerges. And Octavia was right about one thing, those, crisis, those crises are going to continue to emerge. I mean, in many ways, COVID-19 is an offshoot of uh, climate change and uh, deforestation or whatnot. You know, uh, there are environmental issues that contribute yeah. to plague, whether it's specific to this one or not. They are, environment is not separate <laughs> from, from plagues. So right. all, all of these chickens are going to come <laughs> home to roost. And I think we've been talking about climate change and Octavia began talking about climate change. So that's, you know, that's, that's around, that's ne not around the corner. That's next, you know, that's the next thing we need to really, uh, for survivability, pay attention to, you know, yeah. it's not just about, you know, when will our favorite TV shows go back into production, although I'm very concerned about that too, but <laughs> what about our planet? <laughs> Let's, we cannot go back to having our heads in the sand to whatever right. degree we have had our heads in the sand. Right. We have more questions. Um, so this question talks about what Octavia would, and this is a couple of people have access in, in various forms, what do you think Octavia would think about the current times and authors that address um, speculative fiction um, in the future? Hmm. I will say it is harder and harder to write post-apocalyptic fiction um, because 
reality is is such a strong rival for for anything in a in a fiction writer's imagination uh as a fiction writer i've written a lot about pandemics but i didn't i didn't think about masks as fashion you know what i mean that that slipped by me i didn't realize that would be a thing i should have known um but to answer your question about octavia specifically i don't think that octavia would be surprised by anything that is happening today she would not have been surprised by the election of donald trump she would not have been surprised by the lack of federal response to this pandemic. I think she understood very well uh, the mm -hmm. capacity for human denial and how resistant we are to change, which I think is why it's so revolutionary that she says God has changed because frankly, most of us just do not like it. <laughs> you know, it's just even small things, you know, there are people, there are people listening to this right now, um, hanging on to jobs they, they low key hated for years because to change from that job, to even investigate a change from that job is upsetting on a, on a level because we do not like change. We just I, don't. No, yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you said that, right? Because I talk about change like, yeah, this is a great thing. Let's get a reality <laughs> of change going on. But it's hard, right? And yes, it's very like, hard. You know, it is for us the great thing and the bad thing. It's great when you want to change something, you, like a bad habit but it sucks when you were perfectly happy with how things were, right? Um, Absolutely. And yet people for millennia have said change is the only constant we see, um, but it's hard. And that's why we have institutions and religions. I mean, their job is to be bulwarks against change, right? I mean, mm. to, to maintain stability and maintain order, right? Right. Amidst change, which is why they change so slowly. Um, <laughs> because that's they're they're meant to resist change, um, so I I appreciate that you said that it's hard. It is so hard, um, even if we know it intellectually, we embrace it in our minds to actually be flexible, to actually adapt. It's difficult, right? And it's, it it's is. uncomfortable, <laughs> um, and yet we're still called forward because we're going. It's, the change will occur, yeah. and what we get to choose is if it's going to be creative or destructive, right? Right. And I think um, when, when people are faced with sort of end of life and the loss of what was, uh, a big part of the difference between someone who is in misery and someone who holds up fairly well, you know, um, is that ability to let go and embrace change, even if that change is the greatest change of all, which yeah. is the change between life and death. But there are people who do it well. And, and, and I try to absorb the lessons from people who do it well, because I would like to do it well myself, you know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, no one likes to think about that, but, but really, you know, we're in a pandemic. Uh, we should have wills at this point, you know? <laughs> so, so we do have to think about it. That is the ultimate yeah. change. And I think on one level, every change mm -hmm. feels like having to face the ultimate change, which is one of the reasons we don't like it is that it reminds us of death. Every move is like a death. They say, you know, it's, you move from one house to another, it's like a death. So emotionally, right. And right. that's, it just reminds us, it reminds us that, that mm -hmm. nothing is permanent, no matter how much we try, we will not be able to hang on to the is. Yeah. I mean, and that's like, you know, to nerd out for a second. I mean, this is what has driven philosophy for millennia, right? <laughs> is that we're finite, right? That there right. is loss, that there is death. And how do we live in the midst of it is like the biggest, one of the biggest philosophical questions out there. Um, and I like that, I like the answer Earthseed gives, right? So for years, various philosophers have looked at that same thing. You know, what, do, what does it mean that we die? <laughs> you know, what's right. the point? How, right. do we, how do we live in the midst of this? And, and Butler gives us this way in a context that is eerily similar, right? Eerily. To, eerily <laughs> similar <laughs> um, to where we are now. Um, I think that uh, another question um, that I've seen a couple of times, mm -hmm. and both of you spoke to this some, um, but the idea of self-care um, and understanding um, how to look towards hope in these bleak times. That's a good, self-care, yes. Um, it's a very, very important uh, phrase right now because uh, some people feel that it's selfish or trivial to watch your favorite 
the entire run, the entire five-year run of your favorite TV show <laughs> when there are so many other things going on. And while we do have to be careful not to so anesthetize ourselves that we are incapable of empathy, that we are incapable of action, that we're not worried about our neighbors, at the same time, we have to understand we can't live with those screams in our heads all the time. There are people screaming everywhere all the time, people who are in pain, people who are in grief. And we know this on one level, and like uh, ProPublica released the, the screaming children, um, you know, uh, who had been detained, the immigrants and separated from their parents, still happening, they're still crying. But you can't listen, you can't hear it all the time. And I think part of the anxiety uh, during a pandemic especially is that everywhere you turn, I mean, not just in the U.S., but around the world, <laughs> we're still confronted with, with all of this need and all of this horror. There's no other word for it. Right. So self-care is that ability to be able to absorb into the self, right? I have had to really step up my meditation game. I use an app I call, called Calm, which is a, a paid app, but there are free resources out there <laughs> that I listen to every night, whether it is nature sounds, the ocean rolling or rainfall or a guided meditation or a bedtime story. I am finding it more and more difficult to go to sleep because those anxieties that we suppress in our waking hours, as many of you know, they attack when you try to go to sleep. So that's where that sleeplessness and insomnia can be intensified. So sleep is really the, the number one uh, thing you should seek. Uh, lack of sleep can cause illness. I know if I had just a tickle in my throat right now, it would launch me into all kinds of anxiety. So we don't want to have <laughs> the regular everyday illnesses right now, if we can help it. Let's get enough sleep. Next is breathing, and a lot of meditation focuses on breathing. If, you know, whatever horrible thing you're thinking about that might happen isn't happening maybe right that moment. So let's sink into yeah. now and shut those thoughts off. And if you're in crisis, there's also a way to just sort of pull back. And yes, this crisis is happening. I have lived through it. I know Monica has lived through it. But you, you have to find a way, whether it's music, motion, physical motion, walking, dancing. I think that's what I, I was talking about DJ D nice <laughs> dancing. If you can dance, even chair dancing <laughs> is so vital. I think to my yeah. mental health. Think of Alice um, Walker and write hard times require furious dancing. Yeah. A great quote. <laughs> so true. It puts us directly in touch with our child self, you know, who love movement for the sake of movement. Mm -hmm. And as adults, we forget that sometimes. And so, yeah, uh, that self-care is, is important. Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty about closing a door in your isolated home against the other people you're isolated with. I have had to make my backyard another room in the house because I need space. <laughs> you know? So if you're lucky enough, if it's a balcony, whatever it is, somewhere, you can just go and take care of yourself. No matter what the needs are around you, it is so important because you can't help others if, if you're struggling yourself. I mean, yes, I would echo everything you said. And, you know, I think it was so easy to talk about self-care in this kind of luxury sense, right? It's the manis yeah. and the pedis and the massages and spa days that like, oh my gosh, who, had, who gets to do that? Um, I mean, some of us get to do it some of the time. Um, but I love how, you know, Audre Lorde reminds us it's a political act. It's a radical act to take care of yourself. <laughs> right? Um, in the midst of caring for others or in the midst of difficult times, in the midst of activism, in the midst of resistance. Um, these are radical activities that we have to tend to. And I know for myself, as a mother, as a woman, I'm socialized, my time, it, I am the first thing to go. Right? And I, I am yes. like, I'm the last on the list. And I had to be like, this has got to stop. <laughs> like, 2020 is the year for that to stop. Um, and because, you know, if I go down, the whole ship goes down. Right. Um, and we don't want anybody going down no. and, and to no, really, don't. you know, which I know intellectually, but to really live out like, okay, this is, this gets to be the time I, I recharge. Yes. Whatever it might look like. It might be a cup of tea with some headphones on. Like it doesn't have to be these radical big things. Right.
Yeah, um, that's a great point about the headphones going back to music. I watched a zombie movie where one of the guys was wearing headphones and they got into an argument where the other one was saying, you aren't even in this. You are escaping into that. Yeah. Right. And it was true. That is music can just take you out yeah. of whatever the situation is. So don't forget music either. Yeah. And I also don't have a TV. So that helps a lot. Oh, wow. It helps contain the, you know, the bad news. I have to go looking for it. That's amazing that you don't have a TV, but okay, great. Good for you. <laughs> I think, you know, we don't want to keep you all, all, all day, all afternoon. So maybe we have time for one more question and then we can talk about what's next. Then I want to preview the series, what's happening now. I know, right? So can we, do we have one more question? Yeah, I won't believe it. Yeah, this one's a, an overview question of how you would place this book, um, Parable of the Sower, in relationship to other works by Octavia Butler. Um, like the arc of her imagination is was actually mm. asked the question. That's tough. I know we're both like I needed her to live to give us more books, really. <laughs> yeah, let's just start with that. We lost Octavia too soon. Too young. You know, too in two thousand six. And she was planning to write a third in this series, a parable of the trickster. Oh. And I we can only imagine what, what that might have been. Uh so you know, it's so difficult because as I think you said earlier, Monica, this is so different from her other works, right? Mm -hmm. So Kindred is its own thing, right? And often mm -hmm. that's the first book. If no one has, if someone has never read Octavia, mm -hmm. very often the first novel I will suggest is Kindred, is sort of the entree point because it's dealing with American slavery or slavery in the United States. Uh, what would happen if you got whisked back into the antebellum slavery era? Mm -hmm. Um, Parable, though, is also one of those that I rec recommend to first-time readers because it's accessible as social science fiction. It's not the aliens and biology and her xenogenesis you know, trilogy <laughs> that starts with Dawn, you know what I mean? <laughs> you have to be sort of hardcore, well, like, hard into science. <laughs> It's, it's not the telepathy of the Pattern Master series, although it's also a great series. I mean, there's so many to choose from, but I would say that in terms of accessibility to the widest audience, where you can literally sort of apply the book to a wound, <laughs> mm -hmm. Parable of the Sower might be the most profound in that sense. It's the most applicable book. It's the book that, that literally by the time you've read it, you have a new religion as a tool <laughs> mm -hmm. to help you get through your day. So mm -hmm. it, it might be, I mean, I, yeah, they're so different and, and they have value for different reasons. But, but for that reason, I think Parable, the mo reason most of you were here is because mm -hmm. Parable just has that sense of urgency in the now. Don't forget Fledgling. Fledgling is great too. Oh, I know. I was waiting for a second one for that too. I mean, I agree with everything you said. I mean, I think I'm maybe the only person I know who doesn't love Kindred um because mm. i liked the hardcore and the genesis stuff right. <laughs> and the pattern master well she literally told us she did that to sort of address criticism <laughs> that she wasn't writing directly enough about the black yeah. struggle yeah um you know and i didn't like science fiction right and, and we've had these conversations before because of what i was given to read like i you know i had this volume of um should i say names well anyway it's a very classic it's isaac asimov's i robot right someone gave me as a child and i was like i am not feeling this i just wasn't feeling it and it's you know which is like the work you do and so many other afrofuturists do like you have to see yourself you know in what you you're do. reading you do and i was like this was not made for me <laughs> and then you know so that's one thing i love about parable and fledgling and you know the value of, of kindred is you know, it gives, you see yourself, right? It, ref, you ref, it reflects back on you. And I think that's what we need to love to read, um, to spark our imagination, right? Is to see right. how we can be there and to see parts of our world, um, parts of our experiences, parts of our understanding reflected back to us or refracted perhaps even better um, yeah. back to us so that we can imagine our own worlds. I mean, this is, these are the things that make you love to read as a kid, right? Right. Um, so yeah, I would, I would, you know, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to do a hierarchy, but I, it would be the first I would recommend of her mm. stuff too. Well, I'm ready to plug. I can't sit on this anymore. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, so. I mean we, it started as a text and we said, hey, this would be great. 
but there are so many great um, artists and scholars around Octavia that we could not possibly just contain it to this one day. Mm -hmm. And some of you may have seen the recent live stream of the Parable of the Sower opera concert that Toshi Reagan um, co-wrote with her mother from Sweet Honey in the Rock, um, Bernice uh, Reagan Johnson. And I, I've had the song, Has Anybody Seen My Father? Don't Let Your Baby Go to Olivar. Those songs have been on my head. I was so inspired and I thought, oh, I wonder if we could get Toshi to come do a webinar. And guess what? Toshi said yes. So next Saturday, May 9th, we're going to have Toshi Reagan and Ayana Jameson, who is the head of the Octavia Butler Legacy Network. They had a talk back mm -hmm. after the UCLA Parable of the Sower concert that was the last public event I attended before the pandemic. How fitting is that? And as she said, when she landed at the airport, they said, oh, I don't know if you heard, we're in a state of emergency. And she was like, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but what people don't understand is, she, this is not a concert, this is a talk, but what people don't understand is that her mind and her brilliance are on the same plane as her voice. So, to just you all are in for a treat. Do not miss next Saturday with Toshi Reagan and Ayana Jameson. And then we're following pandemic. <laughs> right? And then we're following that up on May 16th. Oh, I wait, let me tell you real fast. If you oh, want to sure. get on that one, um, I don't know if you have a slide for this, but you can register at bit.ly. <laughs> bit.ly oh, forward now. slash, yeah, Octavia tried two. Octavia tried the number two. Right. We're just doing one, two, and now, and number three. Will be, we talked about the, this great artwork from the Parable of the Sower graphic novel. We are going to have the creators of the graphic novel, John Jennings, who did the illustration, Damian Duffy, who wrote it, um, and joined by my husband, Stephen Barnes, who knew Octavia for 20 years as we discuss the impact of art and Parable of the Sower. So we have three set up, and I just texted with Adrian today. She said, I can do it in June. So we're going to figure out a date to have Adrian Marie Brown uh, talk about emergent strategy. Oh, I'm, I, I haven't told you that, Monica, have I? <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll Thanks. figure it out. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think we will. I don't know for sure. I can't promise that one. But these two are set, May 9th and May 16th. Please do come back and join us. There will be videos available of this webinar and all of our webinars when they are complete but for the month of May we are all up in parable of the sower and its healing power uh, and prophecy through this pandemic yeah this is this is our I mean it's fun for us as you can tell but this was this is our gift I guess of, of mm -hmm. really having us all think about you know and lift up kind of the ways that parable challenges us and encourages us, <laughs> um, you know, during this pandemic time. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you both the chance to talk about the work that uh, you're doing mm -hmm. as well, oh, right. um, uh, because you're both wonderful panelists who are doing very, very important work. And I thought it was important also to give you a space to do that as well. Well, thank you for that, Clayton. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I've been teaching Afrofuturism, which I teach as the Black speculative arts, meaning the science fiction, fantasy, horror, magical realism in books, film, music, comics, all of it, uh, from all over the world in the African diaspora. And so many people were asking me about the UCLA class that Stephen Barnes, my husband, and I taught a 10-week online Afrofuturism overview webinar, which is on sale at www.afrofuturismwebinar.com. Maybe that can be your quarantine hobby, but it's taken at your own pace. It's 10 pre-recorded lectures and suggested works, including obviously Octavia Butler. So uh, check it out. And I have long felt really passionate about this theology of change. You know, I rearranged my life as a doctoral student to um, become one of the experts, I guess I'll say, at least a scholar in process theology, which is our a name, our kind of systematic way of talking about a theology of change. And I've long really just wanted to be able to do that outside of graduate school, right? It's this kind of, it becomes a something you just can only get to if you can find someone who knows it to teach it to you, or you can wade through a book. And in Making a Way Out of No Way, a womanist theology, I do talk about process theology and I talk about Parable the Sower, which is to me just a model of salvation. And I talk about that in that text, but I've also um, have some e-courses coming up. So you can go to Process Theology 101 and uh, starting in June, 
will be in class. And so. Oh, live class. No. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> There'll oh, be some class. live me. But oh, be, okay. I see. I see. Okay. It no, it won't be a live class, but there will be some chances for interaction, even in the midst of that. Great. That's exciting. Um, so yes, we're excited about it. We thank everybody for being here. I know we can't even see um, the UD live at the same time. I think we're like looking at Twitter, looking at Zoom, looking at a couple things at the same time. Um, and there is, there's a live cast for those who couldn't get into Zoom. I don't think there's any Zoom account that holds more than 500 people. Um, so it wasn't us, it just capped out. <laughs> um, but again, you register, uh, we'll send it out again Saturday morning. I tried to do a second send about 40 minutes before we started. Um, but if you don't catch it live <laughs> or through Zoom, we uh, will always have the recorded version available somehow. And if you registered, we will have a way to let you know that. And thank you so much, all of you, for being here. When we came up with this idea, we thought we'd be lucky to get a couple of hundred people and so many more people registered, so many more people are still here now, even late into the webinar. I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much, Clayton, for doing the tech so I didn't have to play that Octavia clip myself. You get a track. And Monica, thank you for this fantastic idea. I needed this. Um, and I hope you all also feel like we, we've given you something you needed um, so that we can all heal and survive this together. It's like food for our souls and our minds, at least for me. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so good to see you all. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all next week. Next week with Toshi Reagan and Ayana Jameson. Jameson. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.